always forget I mute myself. But welcome back, guys. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, really appreciate you guys joining on another episode. Um, you know, we have a really great company and uh, two great people behind the company. So um, let's get talking and see who's here tonight. And let me give you guys a quick update on what's going on with us and what's uh, in our, going on in our world. So the biggest thing is that tomorrow night, um, I'm personally flying out to uh, Dallas, Texas, and then we're going to be vending in the NARBC Dallas, Texas. Um, it's uh, Friday. There's actually VIP access from seven to uh, from two p.m. to seven p.m., and then uh, Saturday, Sunday, I believe from nine to five, and then uh, nine to four. Um, but go check out their website. Um, they're at a new location. So they're not in Arlington now, they're in Dallas. So make sure you guys go check their website, check the new address. And um, hopefully you guys can uh, see you guys out there. It looks like there's going to be, a, it's a really big, um, it was called venue this year. I think there's about 400 booths. So I'm not sure exactly how many vendors, but there's a lot of area. Um, we got two tables. We got a, you know, a decent amount of stuff still left from 2023 that we'll have out there, you know, all the way from just, uh, anaconda head albinos all the way to arctic corals you know those albino lavenders um, arctic sables head toffee belly so you know check out our um what's it called our morph market and what's it called and um we are running a special if you guys put a deposit down on any of the animals that we have available on morph market uh, we'll give you guys a discount for pickup at the show so you save on uh shipping and you can pick it up at the show with a discounted price. So that's it. Go ahead and check it out. Our link is down in the description below, as well as ship your reptiles. And um, guys, give me a second because it looks like we are getting. Okay, there we go. Um, and before we start the show, and we go to do a quick shout out to our sponsors and our partners. Sea Serpent Racket Incubators is the official sponsorship of Close Reptile and Scale Success Reptile Podcast. If you're looking for a PVC rack or incubator, make sure to check them out. We've been using their racks for the past two years, and it's a great product, and they have great customer service. Now let's mention our partnerships. Reptilinks has partnered up with Clover's Reptiles and Scale Success Reptile Podcast. If you want to feed a diverse diet to your reptiles, make sure to check them out and use Clover to get $5 off your next order. If you want to take your husbandry and record keeping to the next level, make sure to take advantage of the free 30-day trial with our link in the description below or scan the QR code on your screen. Husbandry Pro has helped us keeping track of our breeding plans, our hatchlings, and overall just keeping us organized with all of our reptiles. Make sure to use shipyourreptiles.com to receive or ship your reptiles and use Clover's 15 to save $15 off any one shipment. All right, you guys saw we have our partners and our sponsorships and Shipper Reptiles is one of our partners. So you guys use Clovers 15 to save $15 off. Um, you know, that's who we use to ship our animals. Great customer service. And we're going to get into that once uh, we bring on Chad and, um, you know, talk a little bit about Ship Your Reptiles and everything he's got going on with that. Because it's not just Ship Your Reptiles. There's a whole handful of other, um, of it was called services that they do offer as well. So, um, you know, Scaly Pigs, what's going on? Thank you for commenting. Guys, if you guys have any question for Chad um, or anything about shipping reptiles, make sure you guys drop a super chat and we'll get to it. All right. Um, we're going to get to this tonight because we do have a limited time. So welcome, Ship Your Reptiles team. Welcome, Chad. Welcome, Susie. Hello. Hello. How's it going? Um, you know, I'm really appreciate that you guys came out tonight and, you know, uh, spend some time with us talking about shipping your reptiles, you guys' company and, um, you know, just reptiles in general. Happy to be on with you, man. Uh, you know, Clover Reptiles and uh, you and the hog nose, those are all things that uh, we are always down to talk about and talk with. So thanks for having us on and looking forward to getting into it. For sure, Chad. And, you know, this is a special one, too, because this will be Susie's first uh, podcast interview um, doing. And, you know, I thought she was perfect to bring on because she does so much uh, within the background and stuff. And, um, you know, she's always at the shows. And, uh, you know, what what can we say? Susie's uh, is really great. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Well, I'm glad to cut my teeth with you. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so real quick, give us a quick overview. Um, you know, how do you, how long you've been in the reptile world and how did you get into it? All right. So I grew up in Southern California and I grew up in an area in Altadena. Most folks haven't heard of that. So I actually grew up mm -hmm. which is right next to Pasadena. So it's not too far, about 25 minutes north of downtown LA. Uh, the San Gabriel Mountains were literally in my backyard. So king snakes, rat snakes, um, go, uh, garter snakes, gopher snakes, um, blind snakes, uh, what else? Um, all types of lizards, California alligator lizards, uh, fence lizards, all the scalopper species, uh, lots of frogs and toads and all that were in my backyard as a kid. So I was always fascinated by reptiles. My mother said no reptiles in her house. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the only kid who suffered from that kind of treatment. Um, so it wasn't until my freshman year at the University of Colorado that I got my first snake. Uh, for my 12-year-old birthday, my mother did buy me a Mexican red knee tarantula. So I got an exotic pet when I was 12, but she said no snake. So it wasn't until I left my mom's house, was in Boulder, Colorado, uh, playing football for the University of Colorado. I got my first snake, a boa constrictor. Uh, I was trying to figure out information and how to feed this animal. And I bumped into a guy who's now become a lifelong friend, Cameron to Pedlin of Bushmaster Reptiles. Those who have been in the game for a long time certainly recognize his his name he, and his company's name. They have brought so many new species into the trade. Uh, a lot of the you know cool blue tree monitors and yellow tree monitors and all that stuff. A lot of the blood python morphs originate with him as well. Um, so he was kind of my guide in the early days of my reptile experience. Um, I was fortunate enough to be an athlete at the University of Colorado. So I also had a little bit of a celebrity on campus. So when I went over to the biology building to see what was going on, I got those professors who would give me free cages or free rodents and things like that. So that was really cool as well. So all those things kind of coming together, meeting Cameron, being out of my mom's house, having these professors who are willing to support my interest really drove my interest. And it probably was my right after my sophomore year, summer of my sophomore year, when I bred my first reptile, a leopard gecko, I actually give, I ended up giving that baby leopard gecko to Cameron's wife at the time um, as a gift for all his, you know, instruction and detail and guidance to me. Um, and then once I uh, left college and was in the NFL, and had some money in my pocket, uh, I built Pro Exotics Reptiles. And we were in business for a, quite a long time. So my, gosh, from 1993 until basically late 2010, uh, Pro Exotics Reptiles existed. Uh, we were one of the largest reptile breeders on the planet, producing several thousand baby reptiles every single year. Uh, we did a lot of world's first, um, but not just in ball pythons, but in other species as well. And uh, I had a tremendous time. And over those years, we bred 85 different species and subspecies of reptile, um, all different types of ball pythons, all different types of boas, all different types of blood pythons, savu pythons, the whole carpet complex, uh, maclots pythons, uh, sand boas. If it's a, a boa or a python, I certainly gave it my absolute best attempt if it was, if it was available. I tried for years and years and years to breed Boland's pythons, never was successful there. Uh, green tree pythons, I bred those. Uh, all different types of lizards, monitor species, geckos, um, African fat tails, leopard geckos, Halamahara geckos, all the Rachidactylus, Lichianus, crested geckos, all that fun stuff. Um, and then a ton of colubrids. We even opened up a retail reptile store along the way where we sold a lot of our animals as well. So it was a really great reptile experience, but it all kind of came crashing to a sudden halt in late 2010 when we had a fire at our facility and essentially 99% of the animal collection perished in that fire. It was, you know, what you would call a really bad day. Yeah. Um, um, but fortunately, about a year before that, we had started the very beginnings of shippy reptiles. So after we settled down from the fire and you know took a stock of what animals we still had alive and what we were going to do the decision was made not to rebuild the animal collection but to focus on all these other things that we were doing with the shipping and with temp guns and reptile report and all those kinds of things 
Um, so we shifted our focus from being animal breeders to kind of serving the animal hobby in these different capacities that we've done. And it's been a tremendously fun road as well. And one of the best aspects of it as a reptile breeder, I'm sure you experienced this as well, Alvaro, is when you breed something, you know, and then you go to Morph Market and you see someone else has bred the same thing. There's a little bit of jealousy in that. There's a little yeah. bit, I hate that guy. He, he, he did it first. Or, you know, you produce your first three or four gene hog nose. And uh, Jeff from JMG, he makes a five gene hog nose. You're like, I hate that dude. So I no longer have that competitive aspect from a breeding perspective. Yeah. I get to go enjoy the few animals that I have in my small collection now. I can visit someone like yourself and I can enjoy your animals. Instead of being jealous or competitive, I can just enjoy all the things that you've got. So uh, the shift from breeder into servicing people in the hobby has actually allowed me to enjoy the hobby and other success in a way that was not very easy for me to do when I was constantly in competition as a reptile breeder. Yeah, that's a very uh, good good like uh, at point of view, you know, because you get so involved with the breeding process. If, if you're doing this, you know, up to the top tier, you get so involved with that process with that it becomes obsessive sometimes. You know, and I totally definitely. understand it. Yeah, definitely uh, obsessive. And you want to, again, you want to be first. You want to be the first guy to do it. You want to be the first guy to breed this project or hatch this this year. So mm -hmm. uh, to to be in this spot where we are now, um, again, I, I can I can go to a reptile show and I can visit every single table and I can find something cool in it that I enjoy at the table. Instead of walking away angry, that guy beat me to it. <laughs> I can just have pure enjoyment. I hear that. I hear that. How about you, Susie? Well, my reptile story is quite a bit shorter. Um, as a kid, I loved catching, you know, garter snakes and toads and frogs, but it was never anything I pursued. And um, but I did always work with animals. I used to show horses professionally, um, and then I was a dog trainer for many years. And um, my animals just keep getting a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller. And now I'm into reptiles and I have my one and only reptile behind me. I have a super dwarf um, that I really lean on Chad a lot to help me when things happen, like I have to feed him. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I've gotten really good at feeding him, actually, and That's he's cool. got quite the appetite, so it makes it a lot easier. Um, but yeah, I was, uh, between jobs, I sold my business. I was, a, you know, had a storefront and I was a dog trainer for 20 years and, um, I sold it and I was looking for something and, and I found this ad on Craigslist that was really weird. And I answered the ad and it ended up being Chad and, and I fell into this incredible position where I get to still work with animals and travel and just have a great time. I hear so, that. Yeah. Very yeah. short history of, of reptiles though. Yeah. And, and I can, I can tell when you guys are at the shows, it's a lot of enjoyment. Um, nice like Chad, like you said, you can walk around that show and just enjoy what's on those tables. Um, because sitting behind the table as a breeder and selling those animals, at least when I'm there, it's a full time from the moment the show, you know, that first person walks in the show, it's, you know, trying to talk to people, explain the animals. It's, it's a lot of work behind those tables, you know. Yeah. Flip that switch on and stay on the entire yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. You know, you know, we did shows as pro exotic reptiles. Mm -hmm. And so I understand how difficult that process is. Um, you know, for us as a shipping company, we ship our boxes out like Monday or Tuesday. And if they get there Wednesday or Thursday, it's okay because it's just boxes of boxes yeah. or deli cups or snake bags or heat packs. But when you're the reptile person, you're coming in from out of state, you're going to drive all those reptiles, you're going to ship them in, you got to get them all set up. There's certain ones that are maybe small or delicate, you got to water them. So I know that process and how much work it takes to vend at a reptile show as an animal breeder. Um, and so that's when, when I go around, and I walk around, I, I like to, you know, stop and chat and, you know, give people compliments because you've worked hard to produce your hog nose or someone else has worked mm -hmm. really hard to produce, maybe it's California king snakes. And you know, over my years, I produce hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of California king snakes, but they're still cool animals and they're beautiful. And there's a lot to be said for that. So 
that person put all the effort to attend the show and be at the show, uh, they certainly deserve a chance to, you know, have a chance to talk about their animals and, you know, for me to explain why I think that animal is cool and to congratulate them on their success. Cool. And then, so, you know, talk about shipping the animals to show. Um, this is going to be my first out of state show. I'm shipping the animals out tomorrow uh, so I can pick up Thursday and stuff like that. Um, you know, what's very interesting when um, non reptile people or even people that are brand new into reptiles ask, how do you get these animals or how do you ship your animals to, you know, a person that buys them out of state? And when we tell them, it's like, oh, we put them in a box and we send them <laughs> FedEx and, and their face is like, what? You know, the, the surprise. <laughs> Um, you know, how, how, what was your first experience in shipping an animal for you? Well, uh, before there was the options of FedEx and, and now UPS, everything had to go air cargo. So it entailed, at least for us in Colorado, a 45 minute to an hour drive to the airport, you know, going to an air cargo office, which is not very customer friendly. Um, they're not, you know, very interested in what you're doing. Um, so it's, it became a three or four hour process, two hours of drive time and maybe two hours there waiting for them to go into the back and find your crate or find your box and sign all the paperwork. It was an incredible hassle, but that's what you had to do back in the day. So when I bought my first albino Burmese, I bought them from Mark Bell from Reptile Industries, uh, before he became Mark Bell of Reptile Industries, where he is now. And when he was just a small breeder in his you know basement in Michigan, but that's how it had to go back then. And so that process really hampered the distribution of reptiles. Uh, when we were breeding leopard geckos as pro exotic reptiles, we had our retail store and we had some retail stores who were partners of ours. But once we ramped up our production from 2000 baby leopard geckos a year to 5000 baby leopard geckos a year, it was difficult because you didn't have a distribution to get them to your customers. Who's going to do this four hour process to receive a gecko at their airport? Not very many people, it turns out. So then you got to start dropping the price lower and lower and lower just to send out your baby 5,000 baby leopard geckos to just to get them out of, out of, out of your space and not feed all those babies. Mm -hmm. um, well, eventually we, you know, we made the group much smaller because we thought, well, we can't continue to produce these many. It wasn't a production issue. It wasn't an issue of people wanting those reptiles. It was how do we get the reptiles to them? That was the issue. The distribution was the issue. So uh, right around that time, we started investigating what is a better way to do this? And obviously, UPS and FedEx do next day air delivery. Um, so we started talking with some folks in the industry um, and we found somebody who was beginning to use that not as a third party model as we do to allow you to ship through us, but just to send out his own animals. So that's where we started making our first contacts with UPS back then was to use them to ship our animals out to their new homes. And that opened up the distribution model greatly. People didn't have to come to shows to buy our animals. People didn't have to drive to the airport and go through all that headache and hassle. They could literally order an animal. We could put it in a box and it would be to their door the next day. And after several years of doing that, the thought became, this is so awesome. And people are always emailing us with questions on how do you become a reptile business? How do I turn my four or five reptiles into a reptile business? And we thought there's enough people out there who want to grow their small collection and become a hobbyist slash business that there's an opportunity for us to become their shipping partner and help them with this shipping process. And that's, that's what we did uh, in about two, early 2010. We made those first inroads to having those conversations with UPS, explaining the business model, building a software to be able to do this. Um, so that's how that shifted from airport shipping to now FedEx and UPS providing the logistics in between and really allowing the greater distribution of reptiles all over the country. And, and that's that's a uh, you know, I th I don't think people uh, really understand how um, how much of a what's it called luxury it is to have ship your reptiles. Um, you know, just a simple fact of for the rates, you know, um, and then everything else that comes with it, right? Um, you know, and talk about customer service. You know, I was, from the beginning I talked to Susie back and forth and stuff like that, and set up my account, and then, then you know talking about being partnerships with shipper reptiles and um, the customer service is a big part of it. 
Um, what, what, when did Ship Your Reptiles like really start taking off and you guys had a constant flow, like a daily flow of, of animals, of orders? Uh, well, I think I can remember early on, you know, when if we did 10 shipments a week, that was awesome. You know, uh, me and my former <laughs> partner were answering the phone to ourselves and doing all the customer service and all that ourselves. Um, then it was 50 shipments a week. And then I, we had our first 100 shipment week. Yes. Um, but at that time, around that same time, uh, the situation with UPS began to fall apart. Um, UPS at that time was not allowing snakes to their system. Um, our UPS rep didn't get the approvals from the highest levels of UPS. They were a little bit uncomfortable with our business model where we're selling labels, but we're not actually packing the animals. And so they felt like there was not enough control in that process. Um, so I began trying to get some inroads with FedEx, trying to make some contacts with FedEx. And it took 13 months, 13 months from the first phone call to FedEx before I finally got approval. And I was told no four or five times. Uh, we're not going to do that. It sounds crazy. This third party shipping, shipping snakes. You guys are going to be putting giant anacondas in the system. You know, they were just picturing all the worst things they could possibly picture. You know, the pilots are going to be afraid. They're going to be afraid to fly the planes because snakes are going to be in the cargo hold. So it took a lot of convincing, a lot of time. Um, and I ended up coming up with a hundred plus page business plan that I sent to FedEx. Um, I made it as professional as a document as we possibly could with research and numbers and all those kind of things. So it probably took, to answer your question, about three years, four years before we became a, a steady part of, of the hobby. And we had a solid footing with FedEx, a company that was willing to uh, service our business. And we were getting enough volume to where now we were not just reselling labels, but now we're selling boxes and we're doing all the add-ons and we're selling all the products as well. Really a full service shipping company where you can go to our website and get everything you could possibly need to ship a reptile. Yeah. And um, and so you guys were, were you guys the first to do this model of, of business? There, like, was, there was one company before us okay. um, who tried it um, and they end up stealing people's money they had a good idea, but their execution was very poor. They didn't get approvals from FedEx or UPS. Um, they were bringing in money to essentially build this business and, and not doing fair by their partners. Um, so it, it went down within a, a few months, but it wasn't their idea that we took. We already previously had the idea, mm -hmm. but we saw with the small amount of success that they had, that there's an opportunity out there. So our thoughts, had, had already been relatively successful, but we were far better business people than these people. We were going to be able to pull this off. Gotcha. Yeah, man, uh, an idea goes so far if you don't execute it right properly. That's right. that's a big part of it. Um, now, talking about customer service, it's because, like I said, I've, I've only had great customer service with you guys. When, when did you guys, um, you know, develop such crap customer service? And, and how many how many people you guys have on your team now? I, I'm going to jump in real quick. I'm going to let yeah. Susie go in, in detail on the customer service. Mm -hmm. But just as a company philosophy, um, you know, I played in the NFL. Mm -hmm. So um, life has been pretty good to me. So I don't need to steal pennies from my customers. I don't need to steal dollars from my customers. Um, so whether it was with the reptile business, for example, reptiles, if there was an issue, well, then I want to service you as a customer. I don't, I want you to walk away with having a fantastic experience. So that customer service model that I developed as a reptile breeder, I want everybody to get their animal and be wowed by it. It's the exact animal we talked about. It was well packaged. It was delivered well. It's feeding. It's all the things that we said it was, or hopefully even more than what we said it was. And you are just having a wonderful experience. So to take that same philosophy and bring it to ship your reptiles. Well, that takes a lot of customer service people. It takes a lot of dedicated employees. And I'll let Susie kind of run with this answer here. Yeah, we have, I believe, five people in customer service. Andy's a manager and he's got a great staff underneath him. Um, we have people on the East Coast that start at 8 a.m. East Coast time. So if you have questions, um, she's there to answer your questions at 8 a.m. 
Um, and then we have people that work the, the late shift. So we can answer questions till 7 p.m. We've got weekend coverage. And um, customer service is clearly what puts us outside of everybody else because everybody on our team loves animals. Doesn't matter if it's a cricket, we're <laughs> going to make sure that that one cricket is alive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the passion that everybody on our team has is incredible. That's great. And, and, you know, talking about, you said crickets, um, had mentioned, it's not just ship your reptiles now, right? You guys have, what is right. it? How many ship other? Your, ship your invertebrates, ship your flora, ship your aquatics, ship your reptiles. And of course our up and coming is ship your semen. <laughs> okay <laughs> cool and, and that's that's another my big face turn red <laughs> that's another big business too with uh, the dog oh, yeah. breeding the horse breeding all, all this other stuff it's it's another big um you know industry within the animal world so it seems like you guys are trying to cover all the avenues that deal with shipping animal yeah. itself or animal product and stuff like that that's really well cool. what Go is ahead. it in um in atlanta is it atlanta no it's georgia where they would be considered animals. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <There's a> lot. <laughs> there, Lots of little yeah. animals. <laughs> Wherever there's a perishable item that has a timely shipping need that also has specialized packaging, and that tends to be most living things, mm -hmm. then that's right for the ship your model. Um, so the I while I grew up uh, talking about my reptile days in Southern California, I also bred aquarium fish in my bedroom. So I bred African cichlids and South American cichlids. And, you know, I did all different types of beta fish. I did piranhas. I did silver arowanas. Um, at my previous house before I moved, I had a 15,000 gallon koi pond in my backyard and had koi in my backyard. So I'm an aquatics hobbyist as well. So to make ship your reptiles, it just seemed natural to go into ship your aquatics. So we service some clownfish breeders. We service some guppy breeders. We service some beta breeders. Uh, we're making some inroads into the koi hobby. So the shipping needs, the customer service needs, the packaging needs, the need for it to be there the next day and on time is very similar for these other uh, hobbies that we're getting into uh, because they have a similar kind of thing in our customer service style of making sure it gets there on time and servicing the heck out of these customers really fits these new niches that we're getting into. Yeah. And like you said, uh, the aquatic, we were at um, Aquashella in Daytona this year. Um, that was pretty cool to see you guys there and um, see the, the the fish world. It's insane how much they have and uh, what's it called? The details they have with their shows. It was pretty cool to attend that thing. That was a fun show. It was so it was. nice meeting you there. For sure. It was. It was really great. Yeah. Um, you know, and talk about customer service. We have a viewer that's asking a question. And um, let's see, you know, how would Ship Your Reptiles team would have handled something like this? OK, I uh, recently had a ball python delayed at the Indy Hub. OK, uh, that person didn't use Ship Your Reptiles. My stake was 50 degrees and I thought she was gone. How do we hold FedEx accountable? Um, so FedEx is incredibly awesome at what they do. And so is UPS as well. Their ability to take a box somewhere in the afternoon or evening and get it across the country to your door by 10.30 the next morning is amazing. If you really think about that process, that is pretty mind-blowing. Somebody shows up at your door in a truck, you hand them a box, and you're in California, and the next day before 10.30 the next morning in Maine or in Miami, um, th that, that box is at someone else's door. But we're not the only people who use FedEx and UPS. Uh, the Indy Hub is the, I think it's the third largest hub for FedEx. Memphis is number one. Oakland is number two on the West Coast. I think MD is number three. Uh, in Memphis, the average night, they do somewhere between seven and 12 million packages a night. A night. So along the way, unfortunately, these things, while very rare, can happen. Um, so these delays, it could be just something that's completely out of FedEx's control. If there is a weather system where that plane is leaving from Indy and going to, uh, let's say, uh, Detroit, and there's weather in Detroit and the planes can't land, 
That's not a FedEx issue. It slows the movement of that package down. But what is FedEx supposed to do? They can't land if the airport won't let them land, if the weather is too bad. Um, FedEx is also not going to send a plane up in the air, which could jeopardize the pilots and all the precious cargo within that plane if that plane's having a mechanical issue. So while is that a FedEx issue? Or we've seen some Boeing planes have some issues recently. <laughs> yeah. Is that a manufacturer's <laughs> issue? So I understand, Heather, that you want to find somebody to blame. Um, at the same time, reptiles are extremely hardy. I know your ball python probably didn't love being 50 degrees, but they're very hardy shippers and they're going to come out okay in those situations. Um, and these circumstances where a package is late is really, really rare. Uh, FedEx and UPS operate under a 2% late ratio. And that doesn't mean like a day delay. That just means a couple of hours. Once we move into a day delay, it's even smaller. Um, so the reptiles, if they are healthy going into the box and they're properly packaged, should be able to be in transit for two or three days at the minimum. So again, they're very hardy animals. I, I know we think of them as so beautiful and precious and we want them to arrive on time, but as evidenced by her little text there, everything's going to be fine in the end, but FedEx does have some things that are outside of their control that can cause some delays like that. Yeah. And human error, you know, is number one too. It's, it's people moving boxes and stuff like that. Um, at one of my previous jobs, and this is not reptile, but we used to ship um, pallets out with material, electrical material and stuff like that. And stuff would just go a pallet, just, disappear into midair oh, wow. you know and, and be gone for a couple days or something and then reappear somewhere um and, and it's just a process of shipping luckily like you said fedex does have a very low rate of um lateness and, and probably even less of actually losing packages um as as a shipper as a breeder shipping stuff out i'm very very like detailed um when somebody tells me you know um where their animal's going i'll go check the weather my weather i'll check their yeah. weather um even the morning before i check the weather and if for oh, some yeah. reason there's something weird hey this is the situation would you want to wait and a lot of people will wait um the, the time if you just give them the reason why they should maybe wait an extra day or two to receive their animals yeah absolutely you, you, you we have our our top bar on our website which is full of information every single day it's updated every single day so if there's some kind of back up in the system. We'll put it up there on the top bar. If there's weather delays around the country. Um, we've had a lot of weather here early in the year. Some of it was East Coast, some of it was West Coast, but then there's been weather all around the country, which can delay things. So we try to keep our customers as informed as possible. So it's a really weird thing as a business to tell people, no, don't use my business right now. Wait till next week yeah. or, or, you know, or whatever the case may be, because we want to give you and those animals best chance for su success. Not only do you view the animals as precious, but we view the animals as precious as well. So whatever goes into the box, we want it to arrive on time and as safely and healthy as possible. So really paying attention to those updates on our website are really going to be critical, those banners on our website. And then there's a few things that you can also do as well as a shipper to ensure that things don't go wrong. Some people sometimes, very rarely, but occasionally, one of those label pouches that FedEx provides may get ripped off. So I recommend really taping your label securely to your box. Um, sometimes you can even write the tracking number on the side of the box. So if the label will be, were to be completely ripped off, they still have the tracking number. They can find that box, enter in the tracking information and put a new label on it and get it on its way. So there's lots of things that you can do as a shipper to prepare for the super rare circumstances that would still give you best chances for success if that rare circumstance were to come up. Yeah. Plus, we do offer insurance. So you can get on time and live insurance, and it costs $2.50. If your package is one minute late, we refund you your, your cost of your label. And that comes out of Chad's pocket. <laughs> so because FedEx won't, won't insure it, so we do. Um, and then we offer you know live arrival insurance too. So if you have a package, that is something that's worth five grand. You can insure that for how much would that be, Chad? 
thirty dollars. <laughs> Two dollars and fifty cents times fifty. Yeah, it's yeah. It, five grand of insurance is not necessarily cheap, but again, if that animal were yeah. to arrive and not be alive, then we would compensate you back. Again, those circumstances are incredibly rare, but yep. certain valuable animals when they're moving to the system need to be insured. Um, there was a alligator breeder from Florida who shipped albino alligators to Alaska. Uh, and this was when albino alligators were just first being reproduced and they were not $20,000 like they are now. I think that animal is a $70,000 animal. It's the most expensive animal I've ever insured. Um, so that animal was insured through my company. Uh, a zoo shipped a Galapagos tortoise to another zoo. Um, and it was a larger Galapagos tortoise. That animal was insured, I think, for $60,000. So uh, on our website, you can insure up to $10,000. If you want to go over that for whatever reason, it requires my approval. Um, I, I'll definitely want to talk to you about your packaging and what's going in the box and all those kind of things so I can understand what's being shipped. Um, so yes, even within uh, the rare circumstance of a DOA, there are ways that, you, that we can take care of you as a customer with our insurance. Yeah. And, you know, that was going to be one of my questions because um, I was going to ask, how does that insurance work? And it's um, very interesting to see that it's ship your reptiles is taking responsibility, not FedEx. Exactly. So, you know, back, back to Heather's, um, you know, question how to hold FedEx accountable. It's almost you can't. And it's, was that with it, like the requirements for to ship reptiles and to them, um, FedEx didn't want to hold liability with shipping and stuff like that? If you put something living into the system, FedEx wants no liability for it, none whatsoever. Yeah. Um, so whether it's fish, whether it's, you know, a stick bug or a box of crickets or, you know, your your baby ball python, FedEx wants no liability for that. So that's why we came up with the insurance program to fill that gap because that was clearly a gap in the FedEx system. I can understand FedEx, you know, they're not animal shipping experts. So their ability to assess proper packaging and provide heat pack advice or cold pack advice or phase pack advice, all these things that we use and understand as shipping reptiles, FedEx doesn't have that knowledge. So for them to offer that kind of insurance with very little understanding and background, I could see why they would not want to do that. But it created a program for us that we think is probably better than anything that they could have provided anyway. And it makes us, you know, because we are insuring what goes in the box, we have even more incentive to make sure that you as a customer uh, know how to properly package, how to properly use a heat pack. And then we also have an incredible incentive to make sure that we give you all the issues, all the warnings and possible issues that are happening because we want your shipment to be successful and we don't want to pay out claims. So we want to give you as much information so that doesn't happen to you and your shipment. That's great. And then, so here's, and then this is um, something that I've, I've had, you know, talking with friends and stuff like that. What are the best days to ship your animals out? Okay. Um, well, if you think about how much, so much of life is now based on e-commerce mm -hmm. and most folks work a nine to five, five days a week. So when they're sitting around on a Saturday and Sunday, that's when they're going to Nike.com and ordering some new shoes or some new socks, mm -hmm. or they're going to their favorite website and buying, I don't know, some new spices for their dinners that week. Well, all those things are going to be delivered through FedEx and UPS. So all those weekend purchases get packed up on Monday and get shipped out on Monday because those e-commerce sites, they don't have to worry about the volume in the system. They just want to get their orders out. We, on the other hand, we need to keep a constant flow of information about what's going on to the system. So while you can ship Monday for Tuesday, there could be an unknown within that. And if we're getting close to a, a Memorial Day sale or a Black Friday sale around Thanksgiving, when there's going to be extra volume within the system, well, you're, there's a potential or at least a greater potential your package could been, be, be delayed. Again, the reptile should be fine, but I want you to have an awesome experience. I don't want you to have the anxiety of where's my box? Is it going to be okay? All that. So we typically recommend not to chip on Monday so we can get an idea of the health of the system and the volume within the system. So Tuesday for Wednesday is recommended. Wednesday for Thursday is recommended. Once we get to Thursday for delivery on Friday, now there's a, if the, the rare circumstance were to come up that there was a, an, a delay and now that package can't be delivered Friday, now it's going to be delivered on Saturday. FedEx is pretty good about making sure those packages get where they're supposed to be on Saturday. 
but they are dealing with a lesser workforce. They go from 100% of the workforce on Friday down to about 20% on a Saturday. Now it's less volume in the system, but there's a chance, very small, that if they can't get it, get it delivered on Saturday, now we can't get it delivered until Monday. So again, if it's a properly packaged animal, everything should be okay, but that's a lot of anxiety for a customer to go through. So if you're gonna ask what the recommended days are, Tuesday for Wednesday, Wednesday for Thursday, every single time. Once we go Monday for Tuesday, we got some unknown. Once we go Thursday for Friday, you know, again, it shouldn't happen, but if it were to happen, your animal may not be delivered until Monday. So we'd rather avoid that if possible as well. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think that will be the worst case scenario. Like you said, that yeah. Friday shutdown, you know, less less employees, less, uh, you know, information coming in and out. Um, and I think I had spoke, if I must, maybe Susie, I spoke to something because I had a customer that was very adamant about shipping Thursday because Friday was only be able to pick up. And that's like, what happens if it doesn't get there in right. some way? You know, and, and she mentions like, look, we can we can call, we can make calls and stuff like that, but there's no guarantee at the end of the day because it is that less workforce. Um, right. And, Those Saturday uh, upgrades are tough, mm -hmm. but that's why we have customer service on on call Saturday and Sunday, just in case that does happen. Yeah. But so it is hard. We definitely want to be there for our customers and service them as best as possible. And particularly in those worst case scenarios. Um, so yes, if you ship Thursday and it wasn't delivered Friday, I can imagine, you know, if you got something in that box, well, no matter what you put in the box you care about, it's we're reptile people. Mm -hmm. uh, the anxiety that that happens. When's it going to be delivered? Is it going to be delivered on Saturday? Oh my gosh, is it going to be okay if it gets there Monday? So we have our customer service staff available to those customers to give them some details, some information, give them some clarity so they can bring their anxiety levels a little bit lower in that yeah. process. Yeah. And um, one one more question is um, any any last any like specialty tips on how to package the animal or, um, you know, anything with the shipping that you guys maybe see like a common mistake that happens when people ship reptiles? Yes. OK. Um, so there are no bad questions. Number one, no bad questions. So a lot of people may be intimidated to ask a question because, oh, I've been in the reptile game for two years and I should know. That's okay if you don't know. Send us an email, send us a text, give us a phone call. You can hit us up any way that's most comfortable for you. And we wanna provide you with all the information you need to be as confident as you possibly can. So this is a, a bit of a, an odd time of year. We're kind of getting out of winter. There's still gonna be some cold days, but it's warm in some places already. You know, here in Arizona, I think it was 80 degrees today. Um, so if I were shipping out of here to another place in Arizona, I wouldn't want to use a heat pack. Mm -hmm. But if I'm going from here to North Dakota, well, then I might. And then, so that's two different temperatures. How do I, should I use a heat pack? How should I use a heat pack? All those kinds of things. So the, any questions you may have, hit us up. Rather than make a mistake by leaning upon your own understanding or in some cases misunderstanding, Get some verification from us. We'd be happy to provide you with some concrete information that you can use to best package your animals. The number one customer mistake when shipping animals is always going to be improper heat pack use. Yep. Always, every single time, as far as causing DOAs. Now, people leaving off apartment numbers or not spelling the street wrong, right? That's always going to be because people are typing on the computer and people aren't always necessarily good at that. It may forget the apartment number. So address corrections are always going to be an issue, but that typically gets corrected pretty easily. That heat pack, if you've improperly used a heat pack, now you can put your animal in jeopardy. It's one thing for it to be a delay because there wasn't an apartment number on the box. The animal can handle that. FedEx is good at that. But if you improperly use a heat pack, that animal's life could be in jeopardy. And that is typically the number one cause of DOAs is improper heat pack use. So the hand warmers you use for going skiing, uh-uh, that don't cut it. You have to use the proper type of hand warmer and you have to understand how to use them. And you want to make sure that your animal is never in contact with that hand warmer. Those hand warmers can spike at over 120 degrees. So if it's in contact with your ball python, maybe you use a small seven by seven by six box, you put the hand warmer on the bottom and you put your ball python in a deli cup right on top of that hand warmer. 
that's not a good situation. You've essentially cooked your ball python. So make sure you're using the heat packs properly. Would If everyone were to do that, we could reduce DOAs to virtually nothing just simply by correcting improper heat pack use. That's, that's, a, that's a great tip. Um, and one of the things that I noticed was at least, you know, and I ship Western hognose, but I think general um, reptiles can withstand a little better on the colder side oh, yeah. than on the higher heat side. Um, one thing that I've preached to my friends and people that I ship to is um, the face packs. Those things yes. are amazing. I, I pay the extra because I really enjoy it. I did a quick video last year. Um, shipping during um, summer with face packs. And, I love that video. That was know, really great. Thank you. Thank you. And, yeah. and it hasn't failed me once using yeah. that. Um, I don't think we've had a reported DOA with a customer who had a face pack in the box. Mm -hmm. We uh, looked back 18 months and there was not a DOA. Yep. So the, the, so those who are unaware, the face packs is a material that changes phase. That's why it's called a face pack from solid to liquid as it's either giving off heat or absorbing heat, giving off cool or absorbing cool. So we're all familiar with those commercials. This mattress is going to make you feel cool or this pillow is going to make you feel cool. Well, it's that same technology that is put into this pack where that material inside wants to be a certain temperature. So the face packs that we are using right now, uh, they want to be about 74. Sorry. Although I don't feel like the blankets work, you know, or the, the pillows work, Chad, but I know the face packs work. I, I think our body heat overcomes that yeah. ability of that phase material during the course of a night. But when you initially lay down on that bed, it does feel cool. Or you initially lay down on a pillow, it, it does feel cool. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I'm 235 pounds of, of, of you know, hot man. And not hot, like <laughs> cheap, but just temperature hot. Um, so that we know what you mean. <laughs> that can overwhelm that material in your mattress. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, so while he's gone, I'll just keep on talking here. So that that face pack material is is tremendous. So it wants to maintain that temperature. So even if it's a great spring day where you're shipping from, and it's a great spring day where it's going to. This animal is also going to go up on a plane at 30,000 feet and it's going to be much cooler up there. So even if it's temperatures are great everywhere you're going, we don't take the temperature at 30,000 feet. It's pretty, it can get colder in that hold yeah. on that FedEx or UPS plane. So the phase packs, even if they're not needed on the ground, can be really nice at stabilizing the temperature within the box when it's going through the system, particularly when it's up in the plane at 30,000 feet. Totally agree. Yeah. I love those phase packs They're and they're reusable. So whoever you ship to, if they're shipping, they're going to reuse this the next time they have a clutch and they want to ship out. So it's like a little gift on top of it. Yeah. We've uh, worked with a manufacturer to come up with some phase packs that meet our design needs. Um, and then we're beginning to buy th those in a greater volume. So I look forward to down the road offering a cheaper insurance price for customers who put a face pack in the box. That's how much I believe in that product. That's how awesome that product is. That's how many reptile lives that product is saved. I will yeah. give you a discount on your insurance. You put one of those in the box. So um, I would say if there's, if there's a best practices, including a face pack in your shipment, would meet the best practice for reptile shipping. Um, it's going to stabilize the temperatures. It's going to keep your animals far safer. It's going to prevent, uh, almost virtually eliminate DOAs. And in the case of using ship, ship your reptiles, it'll also save you money on your insurance. So it's like a win all the way around. Yeah. All for a dollar or two more than just a heat pack. You can buy a phase pack, again, to Susie's point, that is reusable time and time and time again. And those adapt tech that you use, uh, that we use are really nice. That plastic that is used on them. We don't have to worry about it puncturing. Yeah, they're they're wonderful. Yeah, early phase packs uh, left something to be desired, but we've gotten with the manufacturing and created a phase pack that yep. we, we think is ideal for what we're doing and incredibly safe and again, saves animals' lives. 
Looks like Heather B has another question here. Are more sellers using those these days? I don't ship yet, but haven't received any using them. Um, they are becoming more common, Heather, uh, and more and more folks are using them. They really got their starts in the amphibian shipping because amphibians can be so sensitive during shipping, particular, particularly uh, temperature-wise. Um, you ship too cold, amphibians don't do well in too cold. They definitely don't do well when they get too hot. Um, so the face packs were used by amphibian folks, and they were they were sometimes they were putting four and five of them in the, in a single box if it was a valuable shipment of amphibians. Well, I think we've kind of dialed in the proper size or the proper number of face packs per box. So you don't have to just guess at that anymore. You can hit us up with a call, an email, or a text asking advice on that. But I would definitely think more folks are using them. And I look forward to more and more people using them because, again, it's the best way possible to make your shipment. Best chance to post itself. Guys, um, I'm going to have to let you go. We had a little emergency going on here with one of our daughters. Um, okay. So thank you guys for coming on. Um, I'm going to have to end the live at now. Okay. All right. We'll talk. All right. Okay. All right. Take it All easy. Right. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for having us, man. Thank you.